imagine this. What if we could do business without selling? What if we could have all the results we want in our professional careers or businesses without ever having to sell? Hi, I'm Farnoosh Brock, and it is a privilege to be here at Google with you today talking about my book, The Serving Mindset. We're going to talk about how you can change your conversations from selling to serving to achieve anything you want. I come from an academic family. I studied electrical engineering in college. I wrote a master's thesis on spread spectrum code division multiple access for wireless communications. I tell you that to show you how far I was from the world of selling. And I liked it that way. All my life, the way I had been experiencing traditional selling, the way people had pitched their agenda to me, had really turned me off of selling. And so when I went to the corporate world to start my career, I wanted to build a nice protective shell around myself to avoid selling and to keep my attitude and distance around selling. And I was lucky, my technical roles allowed me to do that. There were those occasions when I had to sell myself to my management, which I did very poorly, but otherwise, I was able to make a living and still keep my distance from selling. Until 2011, when I decided to quit my job and start my business. And that is when my nice protective shell cracked open. I couldn't keep that distance or attitude around selling because I was in business now. And yet, how could I go out there and be selling when I couldn't stand being sold to? That's when I felt this was a real dilemma. And yet, even then, deep down, I felt there was a way I could stay in business and maybe even thrive in my business and be true to my character and my values and like who I was by the end of the day. So that curiosity led me down a path of research, which later became the foundation of the book, The Serving Mindset. In that research, I found, much to my relief, that I am far from the only one having this dilemma around selling. Smart, talented, highly educated professionals and entrepreneurs like us struggle with this every day. Why? Because nobody likes to be sold to, not even your most eager buyer in the world. And yet we feel we have to sell because we need to create the results that we want in our careers and our businesses. And so from that perspective, selling becomes the necessary evil in the equation. And I've seen two paths emerge from that. One is for those of us who feel, well, what's a little compromise around my values? At least I'm being responsible. I am doing what I need to do to get my job done. Even as I feel conflicted about it, even as I apologize for the selling I'm doing, I do what needs to be done. There is the other path for those of us who feel, I can't stand selling, I am not a salesperson, so then we need to build that protective shell and find a line of work that allows us to keep that distance because at least at the end of the day, you don't have to do the, na the nauseating work of selling. You're being true to who you are. Now, neither of those two paths serves us because in both of them, we compromise something. And I found maybe we don't have to do the compromise. Do we really have to compromise between our values and our profits or our characters and our bottom line? I found with the serving mindset, you don't have to do that because I remove selling from the equation. We're not going to talk about how to sell more compassionately or more gently or with empathy. No, we are going to remove selling from the equation and yet still achieve the results that we want. Now, before I go further, let me define selling and serving 
so that we are on the same page. The way I define serving is this. Well, no, but let me start with selling. Selling is when you have your own highest agenda at heart. You have your agenda, your goals, and you're going after them. When you sell, you win. When you don't sell, you lose. Serving is when you have your prospect, your would-be customer or client's highest interest at heart, regardless of outcome for you. When you serve, you can only win. When you serve, if they buy from you right away, you win. If they don't buy from you, but buy from you down the road, sometimes months and years down the road, because of how you treated them, you still win. Sometimes your prospect never buys from you, but they refer you, they endorse you, they speak highly of you because of the way you served them. So that's the, the way I define selling and serving. Now, I said earlier, we are going to remove selling from the equation. Let's see how we can do that and get away with it, so to speak. So to do that, we start by looking at our mindset. Our mindset is our perspective onto the world. It's our version of reality. Your mindset is a collection of beliefs that you have accumulated over the course of your life, your upbringing, your relationships, your education, and it's your truth on cer certain subject matters. Now, having lived life, you may also know that after some transformative experiences, you may emerge with a shift in mindset, a shift in perspective. So your mindset isn't set in stone. What we want to explore together today is that mindset around selling. Even if you've never thought about it, you have a current mindset around selling. What I want to explore with you is, is that mindset accurate, is it true, and is it helping you do your greatest work in this world and serve yourself and those that you hope to impact? So we're going to do that by exploring the three guiding principles of the serving mindset. The first principle says, stop selling, start serving. In this principle, you rewire your brain and you remove selling from your inner dialogue, from your inner voice. So your conversation, your inner dialogue becomes, I am not having sales conversations, I am having serving conversations. I am not in a sales role, I am in a serving role. I do not need a selling strategy, thank you very much. I need a serving strategy. When you do this, when you start to remove selling from your inner dialogue, you feel a sense of ease and calm. I see this when I work with my clients. They immediately feel a sense of ease because instinctively you are wired to help, to be of genuine help and service. You feel you have to do more, hence the pressure of selling, but instinctively you are wired to help. So when you give yourself permission to remove the word selling from your inner dialogue, you feel a sense of ease and calm. So if years down the road, you remember nothing else from this talk, except I am not selling, I am serving. Every time you enter those conversations, you will have taken away the golden nugget. But we're gonna continue. Let's look at how we can do this. Let's make it more practical and tangible. To do that, you need to be willing to set aside something that you've been carrying with yourself for a long time. And that is your agenda. We all have an agenda. Whether your agenda is to get promoted to that vice president role, or to get a yes on that contract, or to bring on board 10 more clients, you have an agenda. Now, there's nothing wrong with an agenda, but, when your mind is on an agenda, when you are in a conversation with your prospect, it pulls you out of the present moment with your prospect. It is impossible to be 100% present with someone and have your mind on an agenda. Now, why do you want to be 100% present with them? Because 
That is the only way we can form a genuine connection. It's the only way you can truly listen to what's being said and to hear someone and then to respond accordingly. You cannot do that when your mind is on an agenda of your own. But when you do that, when you set aside your agenda, you can create deep trust in that slowing down and in that listening place. And so as you do that, you are starting to go into the serving mindset. Let's, let's make this practical. I'll share with you an example from one of my clients who learned how to do this. So my client, Patricia, runs a successful IT consulting firm and she's very good at what she does. Now, as an introvert and a techie, she was feeling awkward, tense, and uncomfortable when she would step into her prospecting conversations. And so she came to me because she hated selling. So we started to work together, and we gave her some tools and techniques to overcome this. Now, as she learned how to set aside her agenda, which she hated anyway because she hated selling, but she felt she had to have it, she was suddenly more comfortable in her own skin. And as a result, she was more confident. And then she was stepping into those conversations from that place. And finally, she was able to really hear what her prospects were saying and really, really listen and get to the real challenges, the real problems, not just the surface level ones. As she did this over time, something remarkable started to happen. Her prospects were now leaning into Patricia to ask her how they could work with her, how they could hire her in a business capacity. So she learned how to go from selling to serving by setting aside her agenda, and she was creating real business opportunities as a result. Now, when you learn to do that, you find at the heart of the serving mindset two things, deep caring and deep curiosity for your prospect regardless of outcome for you. So when you do this, you start to create that connection we talked about. You start to lay the foundation of deep trust. And not only that, you do this because you have a solution for them. You have something that could help with their problems. But until you have gone deep into those conversations, you cannot know for a fact whether your genius solution is what they need. And I think it's safe to say we've all been in a place, especially as an engineer where I love to solve problems, where someone comes to you with their challenges and your intention is to help them, but you're not sure whether your solution is right, but you put it forth and it's not quite well received yet. We don't want to offer our solution before it's, we are sure it's the real solution. And so you do that by going deep into a conversation with deep caring and deep curiosity. Now, let's look at how this would look in a corporate life example. I spent 12 years in the corporate world, and since then, I've had the pleasure of working with many corporate professionals from all walks of life. When your average corporate employee reaches a certain level of experience, qualifications, and expertise, they want to advance to that next level and get promoted and move up the ladder. So when similar opportunities present themselves in their organizations, they want to secure it. So the next natural step is having a conversation with their manager. Here is how those conversations usually unfold. The corporate employee shares how much they want that promotion, how well qualified they are for it, and maybe maybe that they even deserve it. They've worked really, really hard to get here. The manager agrees, shows polite interest, and might even make some promises. They have a great conversation together. And then absolutely nothing happens. It's very frustrating because the corporate employee is wondering, 
what else do I need to do? How much harder do I need to work? And it's not about that. It's about the value positioning in that conversation. So what the employee is doing is justifying why they are the best candidate. They may, they may very well be, but that's their approach and that's not serving. So let's see how this conversation would be different if they were to come to it from a place of serving and deep caring and deep curiosity. They would set aside their agenda, which in this case is to get promoted. They would step into that conversation and be really curious about their management's real challenges, about their real problems, about the organization's real goals and struggles, and what a real solution would look like. So they would ask different questions. Some of those questions might be, well, you know, John or Janet, please say your manager's name. Um, I have, uh, I've been doing some research and I believe these are the three top challenges in our project. I would like to explore those further with you. Would you be open to that? Or here is what I see to be the top challenge we have coming up for the organization in the coming year and I have some ideas on how I can be of value toward a solution. Would you be open to exploring that with me? Now this line of questioning shows that you are deeply curious and you care about your management, your company. You're not an individual contributor now. You are a leader. You are having a different conversation altogether. And that welcomes a different response from your manager. Now you may not get promoted from this conversation the next day, next month, or even the next year, but what happens is that you change the perception of your management on you. They begin to see you as value, as an asset to the organization, as a leader. And I have seen this shift in conversations change people's careers, the course of their careers, and invite unexpected opportunities. So we use deep caring and deep curiosity, we set aside our agenda, and we enter those conversations from that place. Now, I talked earlier about how instinctively we all want to be of genuine help and service. Sometimes we confuse serving with pleasing. So we're gonna explore that a little bit. Pleasing is when you are talking to your prospect, and I use the word prospect, I mean your prospective employers, partners, customers, clients, what have you. And you feel you have to agree to everything they say. You have to be nice. You tiptoe around delicate topics. You don't speak your mind because it might upset them, or it might not be something they want to hear, even though it would benefit them. So that's pleasing that is not the same as serving. Remember, with serving, we have our prospects' highest interest at heart. We need to be willing to tell them something that would be of benefit to them, even if it may not be well received. So the distinction between pleasing and serving is what I want to demonstrate in my next example. So one of my other clients, Danielle, is a scientist by training very good at what she does again. She recently got promoted to the role of Chief Marketing Officer, CMO, at her company. In this role, her job was to form key partnerships with other companies. And she was having some struggle doing this. So as we worked together, we saw that her real challenge was she didn't feel comfortable telling her prospects exactly what she wanted to tell them. She felt she had to please them and agree with everything. So as a result, she was having surface level conversations and she wasn't getting res uh, responses to her messages. She wasn't getting invited to other conversations. Her relationships were not moving further. So as we worked together, we gave her several tools to overcome this. One particular tool that she was really able to use was the art of asking permissions. So when she came to a place in the conversation where she felt, I really need to go deeper, but her personal boundaries 
weren't uh, making her feel comfortable, she would say, would, you, would it be okay to ask you more questions around this challenge you shared with me? Would you be comfortable with us exploring that deeper? That way she respected her own boundaries, but she stopped pleasing and went deeper. She did the work of serving. As a result, she got way more than she bargained for. So not only were her prospects, prospective partners, more than happy to tell her their challenges at length, she was able to move forward in those relationships. Why is that? What did she do? Danielle created the safe space for her prospects to feel comfortable with her, to know they wouldn't be judged if they shared a particular fear or something they were ashamed of or their real challenges, and they were able to be vulnerable as a result. So she was able to lay the foundation of real relationships. She was able to get to the real challenges of her prospects and offer her solutions if she saw fit. So Danielle went from pleasing to serving. So in this first guiding principle, I am not selling, I am serving, we saw how you go from selling to serving, how you go from justifying why you're the best candidate to serving, and how you go from pleasing to serving. Right, let's talk about the second guiding principle of the serving mindset, and that is charging appropriately for the value that you deliver. So the value you deliver could be you as a genius asset in your organization, in a company, or it could be a professional service that you deliver. Charging appropriately for that value. Again, in my research, I found smart, talented, highly educated professionals and entrepreneurs like us tend to bet very low on ourselves. We think our value is really small. Why is that? Well, it came to three main reasons, and all of them fall under the umbrella of negative thinking. The first reason, scarcity mindset. There simply isn't enough opportunities out there for me, so I have to grab whatever comes my way. So if you're in a job interview process, you feel, I have to say yes to this job because it could be the last one. If you are prospecting clients, you feel you have to close the one before you because it could be the last one. There simply isn't enough opportunities out there for me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I did this early in my coaching practice. I priced my professional coaching services so low because I had to attract all those few opportunities out there. Well, as a result, I attracted the most unfit clients. Not only were they not the right fit for me, I certainly wasn't the right fit for them. Nobody was served well in this scenario. Scarcity mindset, number one reason we bet low on ourselves. The second reason we bet low on ourselves is lack of worthiness, or rather confusion around worthiness. We just don't think we're worth it. We don't think we are worth the, the high salary we should be asking or the high prices we should be charging for our services. Now, I found with worthiness, we tend to confuse it with arrogance and greed. We tend to think we would come across as arrogant and greed. And who wants that? None of us. So we keep it safe. I'll give you an example here to see how this worthiness issue can be a complete deterrent of your opportunities. So I have a friend who is a professional speaker. He's brilliant, and he really has a good message. He wanted to secure this particular event because he felt his, his message would be of great value to his audience. Well, he also didn't think he could possibly be worth more than $1,500, so that's what he quoted for his speaking fee. The organizers came back to him and said, we're sorry, but we don't put anyone up on that stage who charges less than $5,000. Now, the speaker not only disqualified himself, he robbed his would-be audience of his great message. Worthiness did not serve anyone in this equation. 
The third reason we tend to bet low on ourselves is because we don't think they'll say yes. We think people will say no. And so we make sure we keep it really, really safe. Now, in eight years of being in business and being a coach and having worked with people from all walks of life, I can tell you, every time I try to guess who is willing to invest what, every single time, I was wrong. And not only that, it's none of my business to guess. My business is to serve and to charge appropriately for the value that I deliver. So, some reasons why we bet low on ourselves. But no matter what your reasons, here is the real kicker when you have low prices. Low prices associate you with low quality of work. We established you are no longer a beginner. You are a professional. You have years of experience, expertise, and qualifications behind you. When you charge low prices for your value, you send a very confusing message to your target market. Your ideal prospect knows the value of your work. They know what they are willing to invest in you. Your low prices confuse them and they associate you with low quality of work, which is not fair to you and it certainly isn't the, the right message to send out. So now that we are sufficiently motivated to charge appropriately, yes, let's see how we can turn this around and bring you back to the serving mindset. The f we're gonna use our power to choose our thoughts here. Number one, the abundance mindset, which I'm sure you've guessed, says there is more than enough opportunities out there for me, more than I can imagine. Now, I know it's easy enough for me to stand here and say, okay, choose the abundance mindset over scarcity, but I will give you a really good reason for it. Just as you cannot prove to me this is the last job that's coming your way, this is the last prospective client, you also cannot prove there aren't a hundred more great opportunities out there. Can't prove either one. So why not choose the more empowering thought? Because the minute you do that, you feel a surge of confidence. Imagine going into your conversations from a place of confidence instead of a place of neediness or desperation. You will have different results. The second reason we're gonna bring you back to the serving mindset is to clear up this whole issue around worthiness. Your worth does not fluctuate with your prices. Your worth has nothing to do with your prices. It is who you are as a person. It is your character. It is how you live your life. So what we need to do is separate worthiness from the equation. When you learn to do that, you can think rationally and logically about the value that you deliver and charge appropriately for it. So, three ways we can bring you back to charging appropriately for it, because when you charge appropriately for the value you deliver, you are serving yourself and your prospects. Low prices can hurt you. We need to charge appropriately. Now, this dovetails nicely into our third guiding principle, welcoming and addressing objections. This is my favorite, and this is one that takes a bit of courage, but nothing that we can't muster here. First, I'd like to define objection. An objection is, let's say I've had a great conversation with my prospect, John, and he says to me, Farnoosh, you're great, love to have you. You're the best, we love to hire you, but everything that follows the but is an objection in my prospect's mind. It's the gap between where we are right now together and a resounding yes. We may or may not get there. Now, what happens when we normally receive an objection? We feel a sense of rejection. It's normal. Somebody just said no, especially if it's preceded by a bunch of compliments. It hurts. And after the rejection, what is our next response? We tend to go into a bit of justification 
and self-defense mode. Let me tell you why you really should hire me. No, this is not what you understood. This is why I can really be of value, etc., etc. That thinking pulls you away from the serving mindset because now you're focused on yourself. Now, before we go back to the serving mindset, I'll give you a really good reason around rejection. Even though I totally get it, it's not nice to feel rejected. But here is why it's impossible to be rejected. Remember, we are no longer selling. If you're with me, we are no longer selling, we're only serving. So, if you're not selling anything, what are you being rejected for? You simply put an offer on the table and you receive the response. So, if it's impossible to be rejected, there is no need to go into the justification mode. Now, how do we come to the objections from a place of serving? Well, first, we need to be able to welcome, receive, and explore the objections. We may or may not overcome every objection. Overcoming means that is no longer an issue on our prospect's mind. But sometimes your prospect gives you great information. It may make you think, oh, you know what? Maybe it's not a good idea to engage right now. Maybe it's not a good idea for me to come on board at this time. So we cannot always overcome the objection, but our job is to explore them. Why do we do this? because we want to get to the real objection. So the first reason your prospect gives you is not always the real reason they are saying no. To get to that real reason, you need to have a deep level of trust in that relationship. And our job is to get to the real reason because the real reason helps us decide if we are indeed the right solution for them. So, when you have your prospect's highest interest at heart and you are helping them arrive at a smart decision for them, you learn to welcome and address objections so that we can get to the real objection and then we can see whether we can overcome it together. Let me go back to my example with John. Let's say he says to me, Farnoosh, you're great, we'd love to hire you, but we don't have the budget for it. The world's oldest excuse around business propositions. And I call it an excuse because sometimes it's the real objection, often it is not. Now, how would I respond to John here? I would say, first, John, thank you for sharing that with me. I thank him. Would it be okay if I ask you more questions around that? I ask permission before I probe further. Now, I've never had anyone say, no, you may not ask me any more questions. It may yet happen, but let's assume he says yes, go ahead. And then I would say, John, I am curious, what budget did you have in mind relative to the value I would be delivering? Remember, we just learned to charge appropriately for the value we deliver. A budget doesn't exist in a vacuum. It needs to be relative to the value you deliver to the organization or to the project. Now, John may still shrug off the example. He may still not answer me. We have a fixed budget. I don't know. My job is to stay grounded in who I am, to know my value, so don't go into discounting mode. In fact, don't even talk about the budget. Go back to discussing value. I might say to John, you know, John, I'm curious, how do you see the value I would be adding to the project? What is your vision of us working together? How do you see me helping you towards your desired outcomes, your desired results? You go back to making sure your prospect understands the value that you are going to bring to their work, to their business, to their careers. Now, again, I may not get a straight answer, but what you are doing is creating space for your prospect to confine in you. Very few are willing to go here. Your ego mind is telling you, I don't like this, this is uncomfortable, get me out of here. Don't listen, stay present, create space 
for your prospect to be honest with you, to tell you the real reasons they may not be able to hire you right now, to work with you, and then help them arrive at the best decision based on that information. Now, those are the occasions when your prospect is nice enough to tell you why they don't want to work with you just yet. Sometimes we get a different response. I'm willing to bet we've all had this one. You've had a great conversation. You feel like everything went really, really well. And then they say, so Farnoosh, we love to hire you, love to work with you. We're gonna think about it and get back to you. And then I hear nothing. They just disappear. And I'm feeling, should I follow up? That whole awkward follow up after a conversation because we don't know what really happened. We weren't clear. So that's when your prospect obviously had an objection because we're not sitting on a yes here, but they didn't feel comfortable sharing it with you. So again, if you go back to deep trust and deep caring, and explore that, you might just get them to share. Something you might say would be, you know, Janet, um, I think we've had a great conversation too. I totally respect that you have to go and think about it. Tell me, are there any concerns right now on your mind that I can address for you? Might you have any questions as to what I would be doing, how we would be working together as you make your decision? They may or may not still give you the real objection, but again, you've created space. You have shown your prospect you truly care about them, and you are there to help them make a decision that's right for them. So this does require courage, because like I said, your ego mind wants you to run. But if you stay with it, this is a golden opportunity. If you learn the skill of navigating this part of the conversation, and create space and trust, you will see that you are laying the foundation for a different kind of relationship altogether. So we explored three guiding principles of the serving mindset. Stop selling, start serving. Charge appropriately for the value that you deliver and welcome and address objections. Now I know as professionals, you know how to have conversations. You've been doing it for some time. You know how to go into a conversation and ask questions, and I'm sure you do. But I believe the only opinion that matters when we are having prospecting conversations is that of our prospect. So to that end, might you be willing to take a mental quiz together? You don't need a pen and paper. Right, good, I'm, I'm getting nods. So bring to mind your warmest prospect, your prospective employer, partner, customer, somebody with whom you've been having conversations, you have been doing due diligence, you feel it's, you have a good relationship going, and you're working toward a decision. Now, if I were to call your prospect anonymously and ask them on a scale of one to 10, where one is poor and 10 is excellent, what rating might they give you on how well you understand their real challenge, their real fears and frustrations, their real goals as it relates to your context? What rating might they give you? If it's less than a nine, you don't have to share it with anyone, but there is room for you to go deeper in that beautiful relationship you're building. This is a golden opportunity to deepen that trust and to see that you can indeed change the course of outcomes of those conversations. So my challenge to you is next time you have a prospecting conversation to set aside your agenda, no agenda, to go into it, from a place of deep caring and deep curiosity, regardless of outcome for you, and to see what happens, to see what experience unfolds for both of you. I think you might be pleasantly surprised. So, um, as you think about this and bring the serving mindset into your conversations, you will find that you are developing a deeper level of relationship altogether, that you are creating different results for yourself, and that in the process, 
you are feeling joy and fulfillment in the work. I hope I've given you some good insights today. And now we can go into a Q&A if you like. Um, and I really love your story of like how you went from the corporate world to kind of like creating your own like profitable business in the, in the past like 18 months. It's really amazing. Um, so for me, like I actually run my own kind of career consulting. It's called like Juan Sulting, and I do like these workshops and kind of webinars for students mm -hmm. on the university level. And so like this year, I've actually done about 16 of them. So it's been a really good experience. But um, I struggle with kind of, I've only, only one has been paid. So most of them are like free. Hmm. So, but it's really, you know, it's really fun to do. It's really fun to bring value to people. But for me, like I kind of struggle to find like a price point or like find a price point for the value I bring. So my question would be like, how do you go from basically like free prospects or doing these yes. free workshops yes. to paid workshops? And then also, when do you know when it's time to like leave the corporate world and then go pursue entrepreneurship? Okay, so great questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I would say uh, the pricing. The pricing really, again, comes down to the value you're delivering. You've been doing this work for free, great. You have already experience and you have created, I trust, results for your clients. Look at those results. Look at the impact you had creating those results, whether it was tangible or intangible. So tangible is when some, you help somebody get a raise and it's measurable in dollars and cents. Intangible is when you help someone have more confidence, have more courage, um, make a difficult transition in their lives. Both of those are value that you have helped deliver. And then look at that, and there is different ways to go about this. I mean, when you don't have any baseline, you can just start somewhere. I know it sounds random, and it's not, but you start somewhere. You know, uh, the, the range for coaching services is from $50 an hour to a million dollars a year some coaches charge for. It's a large range, right? So you start somewhere. And I think questions I like to ask myself is, when I get paid for this, for this amount, is this worth it? Is this worth the energy and time on my part? Or will I be resentful for putting all this and feeling like I'm not getting enough? You know, and, and I think that's personal for all of us, that number. And then another thing you can do, since you've already done due diligence for people, is go to your past customers, and you've done it for free for them, so maybe they can owe you a favor, and say, look, I'm wondering, what would you have paid for the value I delivered to you, for the work we did? So get some numbers and see whether you can get some ideas as to what was the value and what is it that people are willing to pay, especially in hindsight, because now they see the value in their lives, in their education, in their careers. And think about how that might give you an idea where to start. And then from there, I think, again, look at the energy you put in, the time you put in, the differences that you make. And of course, with experience, your impact grows. And so your prices should be adapting to that over time, naturally. And uh, your second question was, uh, gosh, uh, when do you know that uh, it's time to leave the corporate world? Um, and I think that's a very personal one for all of us. And it really comes down to your values. You know, if you value a sense of happiness, joy, wellness, health, and if you feel like you're sacrificing that by keeping your job or the culture at the workplace doesn't align to your personal values, family could be a big value. At some point, we reach a tipping point where we just don't want to continue because it's not worth it. Life is short. We want to have a sense of alignment to our values so we enjoy life. And so that tipping point came for me at a certain time. It came for my clients at different times. And I think also being responsible around that decision, right? Because uh, we still have responsibilities. We still have bills to pay. And how to plan around that and uh, maybe adapt our lifestyle so we create a cushion so that we allow the next thing we're going to do, our business, to flourish, to catch up. So if, if I were to give you a short answer, it comes down to values, what really matters to you. And if you feel at the end of the day, your corporate job allows you to do that, or with some shifts, some changes in priorities, you can still do that, then maybe you, you're not at a place to quit your job. And in some places, in some, uh, some occasions, you might be. 
I hope I'm not giving you vague answers. These are big topics, so hopefully giving you some insights to think over. Thank you for your question. Yeah, you bet. So you mentioned you come in and maybe you've got a prospect that you're, you're going to be speaking yes. to. Do you have a ritual or anything that you say or visualize prior to that and that uh, mm. you're able to really connect in that way? Curious what works for you. Yeah, um, not, not so much that, but what I like to do is, I mean, over time, I think more than anything is knowing that I am good at what I do if it's the right prospect. Like knowing the value you deliver, being really grounded in that. So having clarity around what you do and what you do well, and then going into that conversation and, and being open to learn. So I don't have a ritual before, but this, this coming to this place of being really grounded, really knowing what am I about, where, what is my sweet spot, how I can help people, and knowing that I can, and it helps to have those past clients, like Jonathan has, to, to show that, look, there is actual experience here, and keeping that in mind, but also being open to explore, and again, seeing whether there is a fit. I mean, it always helps to maybe have some quiet time before, to learn more about the person, and to have a framework for the conversation. So you are leading that conversation, even as they are sharing, exploring with you. I think that's, that's maybe helpful, and, and you know where it's going, because they are inquiring of your services, and you are kind of leading that to where you want it to go. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding uh, sort of the genesis of this. So mm -hmm. um, typically when we talk about sales and influence discussions, a lot of the emphasis is on um, techniques, uh, frameworks, yeah. scripts, yeah. you know. Um, but I think what's interesting about what you've shared with us is that it is about the mindset. Yes. And I'm just kind of curious as to how you discovered that mindset w w is what unlocked um, yeah. the greater success in those conversations. Sure, great question. Yes, I mean, to give you more context, the first few years in my business, I did all the traditional selling techniques, and I had moderate success. It didn't feel good, like this is strategy, and this question, and this is scarcity mindset, and this manipulation. I did them just to, to experiment, and I had moderate success, but it didn't feel good. And so then I started to just, again, get more confident in what I was doing and what the results I was delivering. And then I just started to go down to the human, human touch, the human dynamics. I mean, I don't have a complicated system. I have a methodology around the serving, but it is really about how you make someone feel heard and understood. It really is about being of genuine help and service and then knowing your own value if there is an opportunity for us to work together. So I might have one conversation with one person, another with another. I take into account their personalities, their styles, because for me, the most important thing is to connect with the individual. Because we do business, we don't do business with faceless companies, we do business with people. Even if you are a B2B, you do business with people. And so it's all about connecting with people. It's not about manipulating them. It's about building a deep relationship through trust, through listening, through slowing down, through setting aside our agenda, but still knowing that we have goals to achieve. And if this is a right fit, we are going to put a nice proposal on the table and really comes down to the relationships. Uh, so... Again, it, how did I discover it? Experimentation. Tons of conversations with many different people. People who would come to me and, and, and learning from people that I respect, watching people have conversations, and seeing what resonates with me, right? Because it has to resonate with you. You can't fake it. So whatever you take away has to be something you really want to embody in that conversation. And I think experience is the best lesson. So you take what I shared here with you, you bring it to a conversation, and you have firsthand experience whether that works better for you or not. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much.